My guest today is Dr. Marian Tupi, who wrote this book that has to do with the 10 global trends, which we'll cover today. Describe him uh, in a proper way. He is the editor of humanprogress.org, a senior fellow at Cato Institute Central for Global Liberty and Prosperity, and the co-author of The Simon Project. He specializes in global globalization and global well-being in politics and economics of Europe and South Africa. He has worked on the Council on Foreign Relations Commissions on Angola and advised the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, and the U.S. Department of State of Central Europe. Thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. Thank you for having me. Yes, and you happen to be from Czech, right? You're, Czechoslovakia, you're Czechoslovakia, yes. Czechoslovakia. So my best friend when I was in Germany at a refugee camp, his name was Jan Staff. Jan Staff, his sister's name was Katarina Staff, and they were from Czech. We were best of friends. Two years we were inseparable. I have great experience with folks from Czech. Good. I hope I don't, I don't disappoint you. No, no. I'm, I'm looking forward <laughs> to this. First of all, I, I read all the articles. I've seen you. You've been interviewed by everybody pretty much at this point. You've been on uh, Ruben, I think. You've been on Jordan Peterson. You've been, you've been everywhere. Obviously, you've been on TV as well, but I'm talking more to pod podcasters. And some of these 10 trends, folks, I'll read this over to you, and then we'll go through them by learning a little bit more about your background. So uh, 10 trends. Trend number one, the great enrichment, Okay. Uh, number two, the end of poverty. Trend number three, are we running out of resources? Number four, peak population. Number five, end of famine. Six, more land for nature. Seven, planet city. Eight, democracy on the march. Nine, the long peace. Ten, a safer world. So before we cover these ten trends, would you mind taking a moment and giving us your background on how you came about doing what you're doing today? Well, about 10 years ago, I read a uh, book by a British author, Matt Ridley, uh, called The Rational Optimist. And the book was just filled with very interesting statistics I didn't know about. And uh, I thought to myself, well, um, you know, why don't we put all of these very interesting statistics online, uh, on, uh, on the Internet? And yep. that's how human progress was born. And then, of course, once we started looking into it, we realized that there is a wealth of evidence, wealth of statistical evidence showing that the world is actually becoming much better along many different dimensions of human well-being. And this is not well known at all. In fact, uh, a few years ago, Americans were polled on, uh, uh, on, on whether they think that the world is getting better or worse. And 66% of Americans thought that the world was getting worse. Only 6% of Americans thought that the world was getting better. In reality, most things uh, that we will discuss today are, in fact, improving. And uh, I'm not the only one doing that. A uh, number of people have come to similar conclusions. Harvard, Harvard uh, psychologist um, Steven Pinker. Uh, then, of course, uh, Hans Rosling, uh, famous yep. from the TED Talks. Um, uh, there's a wonderful website called uh, um, Our World in Data with Max Rosa from Oxford University. So uh, people who don't want to dwell in doom and catastrophism, but who are actually interested about the real state of the world, uh, can just go online and find out uh, about the real state of the world for themselves. So you, you, your major, uh, BA in International Relations and Classics from the University of Virginia, okay, no, okay, so if I was in high, and then you got a PhD also in international, so you're, this, is what you're, this is what you've studied from University of St. Andrews in Great Britain, fantastic, so. I was always interested in, in uh, economic history and Why? human progress is... Why? Well, because I always thought, well, I grew up under communism, where things weren't all that rosy, um, you know, and um, um, then I came to the West, and I realized that uh, things could be much better, and mm -hmm. so I started being interested in things like, well, why are some countries poor? Why are some countries rich? Yep. And then, of course, uh, once you come to the West, you realize that a lot of people are very conflicted about, or rather are, are disappointed by their standards of living. They think that somehow, you know, it is not good enough, and uh, they complain a lot. And then, so I thought to myself, well, we cannot compare them to Eastern Europe. We cannot compare them to um, Africa or so on. Why don't we compare Western standards of living today with Western standards of living 100 or 200 years ago? And that's what I mean by economic history, comparing living standards today with those that preceded centuries or thousands of years. And then you realize just how incredibly lucky we are and how incredibly recent prog uh, progress, economic progress and social progress is. 
So, so would you, would you, by the way, I already, just from the first two minutes, I got a bunch of questions for you, but would you say uh, 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 in communism, people who live in, my family's, uh, my mother's side, they're all communists. The majority of them are communists. Their Bible was a Karl Marx, Communist Manifesto. So if they grew up in uh, Russia, Baku, they thought Stalin, Lenin, good people, great leaders, strong leaders, right? Do you think a citizen in a communistic regime doesn't even know what it means to complain because who the hell is going to listen to you? Like, you know, you can't create a Yelp in communistic regime because you can write all the reviews you want. No one gives a shit. So in a communistic society, they don't know how to complain. But in a capitalistic society where there's so many opportunities, it's almost like the kids are spoiled. They know how to complain because everything's been handed to them. Easy life produces more complainers. Tough life doesn't produce complainers. What I think it's, I, I think it's a question of freedom of speech and uh, freedom of association and uh, free media. So uh, take the, the extant communist regime today, like, like North Korea. Uh, a lot of people genuinely don't know that they live in a slave state that is, you know, 100 years, ago, uh, 100 years behind the West. Uh, they don't have access to good information, especially in the rural areas. In the urban areas, people may get access to clandestinely imported um, um, uh, flash drives um, that tell them about the reality outside. But, you know, especially in the world before the internet and cell phones and so on, it was very difficult, especially in the poor rural areas of communist world, to know that there were countries which were doing much better. So if the government uh, propaganda apparatus tells you all the time, you are living the life of dreams, uh, then some people might actually believe it. Um, but once uh, in Eastern Europe, once true information started filtering through, uh, through VCRs and uh, through uh, Western broadcasts and so on, people started seeing what life is real like in the West compared to what it was in the East. People started complaining very quickly. And communism lost uh, uh, all of its legitimacy and therefore it collapsed. But why, why is it making another rise? You know, last week I interviewed, we had an event at the vault uh, called The Vault in uh, 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 Miami, and we had about a thousand people there. We had Dustin Portier there, we had different speakers at Billy Bean there. One of the speakers I brought out was uh, Gary Kasparov. Mm -hmm. And you know who Gary yes, Kasparov course, is, yes. the famous, the legendary, the greatest of all time, uh, grandmaster chess player who tw 255 months in or he was number one, never lost. He kept number one for that uh, period. he lost to a machine. He lost to a machine, <laughs> IBM, which is uh, called the blue what? What's the machine called? The uh, uh, blue something, right? Blue. Uh, Anyways, there's something blue, uh, the machine he lost to, and then there's some controversy with the machine, by the way, that there was people behind the machine that were oh, playing okay. games. Anyways, but uh, I, he, he, when him and I were talking, he says, Patrick, just know, if you ask me any question, I will answer. So you have to be ready. Do not ask a question that you don't want me to answer. That's my kind of a guy, because I'm going to interview somebody like that. So I said, tell me about communism and uh, deep blue. Yeah, deep blue. I said, tell me about communism. He says, well, when I lived in Russia, Everything was telling us how great of a country Russia is, the greatest country in the world, and U.S. is the enemy and all this other stuff. But the moment I became a good chess player at 13, I started traveling, and he says, finally, I saw capitalism. When I saw what capitalism produces, I could not believe it. Yes. The fact that we are living in, and he says, I wanted more of capitalism, not of communism. Same here, same here. Uh, my first visit to the Western country was in 1989, Christmas, going to Vienna. And it was like stepping out of a black and white movie into a color movie. It was the, 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 the difference was that big. 89. 1989. Communism collapsed in November 1989. And we got to go to the West for the first time as a family in, uh, in, in, over Christmas. You know how I know that? You know why I know those dates make sense? Because in 1989, July 15th, is when we went to Germany at a refugee camp. And my friend Jan Staff showed up end of 89. There you go. Because they were escaping communism and we're together. It was Albania. It was... Uh, Czech, it was Poland, it was uh, uh, Yugoslavia, the old Yugoslavia, you know, all yeah, that stuff, yeah. a lot of that stuff has changed. Uh, by the way, what year is your birthday? You're, 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 I know you're 9, 17, but you're... Are 76. 76, so, so we're was, two years apart. I was apart. 13 when, when communism came So out. you remember, so to, course, you, yeah. to you, the way of living is communism. That's what you saw. Yes. It was the normal. Yes. It was a normal thing. And what did the media propaganda in, at that time, under the communist regime, what was it telling uh, 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 the populace, and what was school... Like when you were going to school at 13, you're going to remember what class was like. That's, that's what? That's ninth grade or eighth grade? 13 is eighth grade, right? Give or take. Seventh or eighth yeah. grade. So what was school teaching you about Czech and U.S.? And what was media telling you 
uh, about well, Czech was, and US. The, the, the upbringing was very similar to what Gary Kasparov has had, which is to say that the media was blaring at you all the time about you know how everything wonderful was. You know, we are const constantly meeting these production targets. Uh, you know, and uh, everything was rosy and. Uh, um, and of course, uh, schools were, uh, were a, an apparatus of indoctrination. Uh, one of the reasons why communists were always very keen on, uh, on uh, making their people literate uh, was, of course, that um, uh, it, uh, it was an easier way to propagandize, to, uh, to, you know, to, to allow them to read in the media only what the government wanted them to read in the media. But, I came from a deeply anti-communist family, and so the conversations around the dinner table provided me with the alternative uh, viewpoint. And um, I, I distinctly remember I was about 10 years old, and I was walking from my grandmother's house uh, down, a, down a street, which was you know, the main shopping mall in, in my hometown. And uh, you know, in, in, in communist countries, on every lamppost, you would have a speaker that was blaring government propaganda at you, you know, for a few hours a day. And as I was walking by these shops, which are completely empty, whilst listening to the radio telling me how, what a great country I was living in and how we once again met the four-year plan in three years and things like that, <laughs> I, I did have a bit of, a, bit of a, an awakening, you know, that, that I was living in... A, it, was, it was like living in two parallel universes. At school, you had to say certain things that were expected from you, but in reality, um, it was obvious that the country wasn't working the way that the government was telling us it was what working. What percentage of the populace at the time was like your parents who were anti-communist, like low-key anti-communist? Well, low-key in a sense that, you know, personal conversations were happening. You that, can't go to the public and say, I don't believe yeah, in the regime. Precisely, precisely. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, um, it had to be high enough so that when uh, the Berlin Wall fell uh, in, in, at the start of November 1989, people realized that communism was at this point very weak and they all went to the streets and the fear was gone by that time, by the late 1980s. People no longer feared um, the, the state. Uh, we no longer feared that the result uh, would be mass executions and yeah, it just sort of collapsed like a souffle. Why were your parents anti-communist? Like where did they get their resources? Where did they get their information um, to? From, from my paternal grandparents. My paternal grandparents were old enough to remember the First Republic before the Second World War, and they remembered that it was possible to live in a prosperous and democratic country. Czechoslovakia was one of the richest countries in the world between the wars. So they kept teaching. So, so then why did they stay? Why didn't they leave? Well, because you couldn't. There was, a, there was an iron iron curtain around Czechoslovakia, you would get shot on the, on the border. Literally? Literally. I mean, you couldn't get a visa to go to the West, obviously, because if you could get a visa to go to the West, West um, then everybody would leave. So uh, they just put up barbed wire and watchtowers, and uh, hundreds of people got slaughtered uh, on, on the border trying to flee into the West, shot, um, uh, torn apart by dogs, electrocuted, things like that. What was life like? What was fun at 12 years old? What were you doing? Well, for as fun? a boy, uh, yeah. you know, you don't care. All you need okay. is a couple Got of it. sticks so like and, and uh, you know, play you. play uh, swords or, or, or musketeers with your um, uh, with your uh, mates, uh, or you um, go and I don't know, climb cherry trees and things like that. It didn't really matter. I think the only thing that I regret is, of course, never having access to things like Western cartoons and uh, uh, Disney and things like that, because of course, all of those were banned. Yeah, I mean, and Western music, which was banned too. Fully? More or less, yeah. So if you got it, it was underground when you got it. You got it on a, on a cassette, yeah, because which was which was you know which was like re-recorded and re-recorded and re-recorded yeah, yeah. with the quality constantly oh, diminishing. I, I, this was before digitalization. Well, we got movies in Iran, but you had if you if you were caught with Rocky IV, you'd go straight to jail. But we had it, and you'd watch these movies, and somebody would do the audio translating translation, and you would listen to somebody doing the Farsi sound of Rocky or somebody doing whatever the movies that we were watching. When was that? This is uh, 78 to uh, 89. So okay, you, so after the, after the revolution. After the, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah after absolutely. The, after the I was born October 18, so you go yeah. 79 on. Okay, so I, no, I get it. Yeah, get everything it. was very underground. You yes. couldn't do it. And yeah. even alcohol, bootleggers were all underground. You were public, you'd go, yeah. In, yeah. You'd go straight that to jail. That wasn't a problem in Eastern Europe. Everybody was drunk to get through the That was one of the like, ways probably yeah. to keep people <laughs> exactly. uh, distracted. <laughs> so going back to it, you know how they say democracy uh, typically... Uh, last 250 years, you, you, that number is typically thrown around with 250 years. Historically, 
How long does a communistic regime last? Is there a number for it? Like you said, it got to a point where the you know, regime got weak, they could no longer do what they were doing, and then we revolted against it, right? And then boom, things change. Is there a timeline where how long that system lasts? I don't think it is cyclical. I mean, basically what happened, uh, the Russia was taken over by the communists in 1917, then because of Hitler's defeat, thank God, but Hitler was defeated and the, uh, and, and the Soviet army marched into Berlin. And of course, all that territory which they covered in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, they kept for themselves as their satellite states. So we exchanged one totalitarian regime, which was the Nazi occupation, for the Soviet occupation, which lasted from 1945 to um, 1989, basically. 40 to 50 years? That, that's how long communism lasted. Other, other regimes obviously survived longer or shorter. Okay, so now let's change topics. You said 66% of Americans believe the world is getting worse. Six percent believes the world's getting better. Yeah. If you turn on the media, the media is telling you this is the most racist time of all time. This yeah. is the worst time to, you know, things are terrible, you know, everything is bad, you know, civilization is not going in the right direction. Why do you think 66 percent of Americans believe it's the worst? It's been in a long time. Well, part of it has to do with the news, uh, in, in a sense that if it bleeds, it leads, right? Um, uh, news is about stuff that happens and what tends to happen are dramatic things like airplanes flying into into buildings or a famine or a, you know uh, what's happening in Afghanistan right now and those things tend to be terrible um, terrible things happen very quickly and they are uh, they are easier to uh, to medialize uh, good things tend to happen on a different time scale gradually over a very long period of time, such as uh, you know increases in GDP, there is never a time, uh, a day or an hour that can that can that can be on the front pages of the New York Times. That okay, overnight the United States stopped being poor and became rich. These things take hundreds of years, and so um, that's also part of the problem. Good things tend to happen over a very long time and gradually. Bad things tend to happen very quickly. Um, so those are some of the things why people, why people believe uh, the world is getting worse. Also, uh, you have the availability heuristic. This is, uh, this is basically how our minds operate. Uh, it, is, uh, the, it is the dramatic, which gets the dramatic event that gets pulled out of your memory file at a, um, a, at a much more frequent uh, stage. And therefore you think that danger and horrible things happen in the world at a must, much, uh, with much greater frequency than they really do. Uh, for example, a lot of people get still obsessed about terrorism, whereas in fact many more Americans die by sleeping on a wet bathroom floor. But that's not a sort of memory that you can pull out of your memory file uh, very quickly. Um, those are just some of the things. Also, I think that it's probably fair to say that we have evolved to be pessimistic. Um, you see, if, if you hear a, a noise behind a bush, uh, you have, uh, you, you can deal with it in two different ways. Uh, you can either proceed on your way or you can run away. Well, if you proceed on your way uh, and there's a tiger or a lion hiding behind it, uh, then you are not an ancestor, right? Uh, your genes get, uh, your, your optimistic genes get wiped out of the pool. So uh, an overreaction to a potential threat, such as running away, is less costly from a genetic evolution standpoint than underreaction to a potential threat. Say that one more time. So running an over, away, an overreaction to a potential less costly threat is less costly. Temporarily, maybe, tempor but not long term, right? Well, in a sense that you get to you Live. get to pa pass right. your your genes on in the right. long run, whereas uh, whereas underreaction to a potential threat is deadly, can be deadly. So the the, the optimists get weeded out of the gene pool. The pessimistic gene remains, and it's very difficult for human brains to cope with the fact that the world is a much better place now because the world has really changed only in the last 200 years so dramatically. Can you unpack that? So one of the things you you said earlier, uh, when we said 66 percent to six percent, and then you said, you know, most things have improved, some things have not, uh, and then we have the 10 global trends that we can give. Maybe this is the part as well. What has improved? What has not improved? Well, almost everything has improved uh, economically. Um, we are much richer than we were. Uh, we live much longer. Uh, many fewer infants die um, between the age, you know, between birth and, and, and year one. Uh, we are much more educated. We go to school for much longer. Literacy is much higher. Um, uh, what are the other things? Um, uh, there's a much greater supply of food than, uh, than before. Um, so uh, economically, 
um, it's, it's unquestionable that we are much better off. We're also much better off medically and scientifically and technologically. Uh, you no longer have to plow your field. Uh, you just go to Whole Foods and buy something that was produced, um, you know, on a large farm that is, um, that is uh, you know, tended to by, by technology mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. Um, but I would say that even morally we have improved. Just consider the sorts of things that, used, that humanity used to do to each other. Cannibalism, gone. Slavery, chattel slavery, gone. Um, exposure of unwanted children, meaning letting them die, gone. Um, uh, mistreatment, deep mistreatment of women. Uh, sure, mistreatment still happens, but, but not to the extent as we knew in, say, ancient Greece and Rome or mm -hmm. indeed in, in, Middle in, East. in the Middle East, in Parthia, where women were basically um, properties of, of men. Yep. Um, so in, uh, along all of these different dimensions, uh, humans uh, have also become more moral. Our, uh, our, um, uh, our homicide rates are a fraction of what they were 500 years ago. Um, uh, we have fewer casualties in, uh, in terms of conflicts when they do happen, and war is also on the decline, but conflicts when they do happen, they tend to result in fewer casualties than before. So those are some, some of the things that the world has improved. What hasn't improved? So, so, so that part, uh, great. What hasn't improved? What hasn't improved? Um, it's actually very difficult to come up with something. That's, that's I mean, I, yeah. um, you know, a lot of people believe that... Uh, um, the environment is not improving and is going to result in a catastrophe. Now, the whole point of human progress and of the book that I have written mm -hmm. is to is not to explain away all the problems, but to try to convince people that we are not like other animals. You know, we are not like rabbits or rats. Uh, when there's a problem that we just wait for for our community or our uh, our herd to collapse when we have a problem we solve it we are adaptive species so we can adapt to changing climatic conditions and we are also problem solvers so that we can solve them uh, so uh, you know uh, climate change is one thing that people are pointing to and saying you know this could be a catastrophic problem well it won't be that much of a problem if we can get all of our energy or most of our energy from non-CO2 producing energy sources such as fission or fusion nuclear reactions. Got it. So the only thing that you would say uh, is uh, uh, climate change, maybe the only thing that we're looking at as an issue. But aside from that, you, there's not a lot of things that's shown that's worse today than it was before. Much depends on your, on your time scope. So for example, freedom of the press is much better than what it was in the 1980s, but it is lower than it was 10 years ago. Okay, we included a trend in the book about freedom of the press because freedom of the press is still much better than what it was, say, 40 years ago. But we have seen some retraction. Also 10 when years. It, yeah, also when it comes to democracy. So the world is much more democratic than what it was in the 1970s. I mean, you know, autocracies were here, democracies were here. Mm -hmm. That has flipped. But in the last 10 years, we have seen some democratic backsliding, okay? And that's something to keep an eye on. But it is still much better than what it was 40 or 50 years ago. So um, along all of these dimensions, things are really improving. Now, there is a caveat to this. When the audience, when the room is large enough, there will always be somebody who will find what I think about as a positive trend and call it a negative trend. So, uh, for example, I would say that increasing human wealth is a good thing. But somebody, perhaps on the extreme environmentally side, might say uh, increased wealth leads to increased consumption and therefore greater climatic damage and therefore that is bad. Or alternatively, I might say, in fact, I do say that education of women is an unalloyed good. It is a good thing. But somebody who is an extremist uh, religious persons, let's say a um, uh, Taliban, mm -hmm. uh, are not terribly keen on, on female no, education, as you know, no. and they feel that educating women is a bad thing. So, so there are these outliers, but my definition of progress is a definition of progress that 90% of humans can agree on. Education, good. Longer life, good. Um, more money, good. That sort of thing. Why do they have a bigger mic than everybody else that understands common sense? Why are they getting so much traction today? You, you told me you are an entertainment. Well, that's, I want, you, you understand what I'm saying? Though? Why, yeah. why are the people that are saying too much wealth is not good and, 
you know, uh, 11 million people following AOC. And so this is not good. This is bad because it's all about climate change because the world is ending in 12 years if we don't do something about it today. Why is she being heard by tens of millions saying she makes um, sense? Why is he, the Taliban, saying, woman, why are they getting so much credibility? The, well, first of all, the world is definitely not ending in 12, 12 years. Of course it's not, but that's, their, sort of that's a, their presentation. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I think that, um, I, I think that uh, ideas which are on the extreme probably get more coverage uh, in the news on both left and the political right. Um, you know, uh, on a show like this, um, or rather, <laughs> on a much lesser show, let's call it a talk show on CNN. It is not really a good show, or Fox, it is not really a good show when you have two people basically agreeing with each other and are congregated somewhere among, uh, along the middle of the public opinion. It's always good to get somebody from the absolute extremes who can scream at each other and present a real contrast. And I think that is the key why these people get more airtime and a bigger mic than people like us. That makes sense, simply because it's more entertaining and we always like a good fight, even today. That's why yes. maybe UFC is doing better than some of these other sports because we're seeing a couple people fight. Okay, one of the trends I want to talk to you about is population, right? One of the trends you're talking about, I think it's number four, peak population, the world population will likely peak at 9.8 billion at around 2080. 2060. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, yeah. But at around 2060 okay. and fall to 9.5 billion by 2100, is that right? Um, so the best estimates we have right now is, so as you know, there are about 8 billion people in the world today. Mm -hmm. And um, according to Lancet, which is a reputable publication, um, by 2100 there is either going to be 9 billion people in the world or 7 billion people in the world. There could be many fewer people in the world how in, they, by how 2100. Are they, how are they coming up with that um, assumption? Well, because we don't quite know how TFR, total fertility rate, is going to play out. So as uh, wealth increases, women get educated and enter the labor force. They tend to have many fewer children than when they, when they, when they work at home. There is such a thing as opportunity cost. If a woman cannot make money in uh, the labor market, uh, stays at home, um, then, uh, well, if she can go into the labor market and make uh, thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars, well, I have a kid. Um, she is much, you know, she's likely, uh, she can make that decision. And in fact, women do. So total fertility rate has declined from about five in 1960 to about 2.4 today. Worldwide? Worldwide. You, worldwide. Okay. In five the United to States, it's about, four. Uh, yeah, uh, from, from about 5 to 2.4. Now, that's worldwide. In the yeah. United States, about 1.7. Today. Today. Now, remember that replacement what rate. What were we in 60, by I'm curious, in U.S. Do you know what the number was in I U.S.? Don't. And okay. I don't. But we're now, in 1.7 today. The world is 2.4 today. 2.4. Okay. Now, the, the issue here is that actually a replacement level is 2.1, meaning that if we want to keep the world's population constant, we need 2.1 children per woman to to just maintain the current population uh, in the west we are already well below it in korea south korea it's one woman one baby per woman per lifetime so uh on on so so you can see uh, you can see the issue there now the reason why we included population growth in uh, in the 10 global trends is because a lot of people are concerned that we have too many people mm -hmm. in the world mm -hmm. that's why we have it however i'm very ambivalent about this trend because uh, progress, economic, technological, medical, scientific, depends on ideas, and ideas are produced by people. The fewer people you have, the fewer people you have to produce ideas which then can re reconnect or interact with each other and then lead to inventions and innovations. So, um, you know, we could really face a world in, say, 60 years' time or 80 years' time that we'll have too few people to maintain our current rate of innovation and also to pay for all the commitments that our governments have made in terms of social welfare spending. So let's go back. 1960 average is 5. Today it's 2.4 worldwide. Yes. U.S. is 1.7. Correct. To stay flat, you need to be at 2.1. Correct. But we're at 1.7 in U.S. Yes. So you mean to tell me... In U.S., because we are a capitalistic nation, which is competitive competition, women are going to sit there and have to make a decision at one point saying, why have a kid? Rather than working 2,500 hours per year like the average competitor, I can only compete at 2,000 hours because the other 500 hours I'm having to raise a child and that's going to take me back. 
So they're going to say, I don't want to have two kids. I'm okay with having one. I'm okay with not even having a kid. Sure. You're saying that gradually it's going to go lower. So are you saying if we go at this pace, where if, if, if the world is going to be at the number that you said, which is 9 billion by 2100, either 9 billion or 7 billion, where is Either you, 1 billion more or 1 billion less than, than today. Than today, yep. 8 billion. So either one more or one less than today. Where is U.S. going to be if we're at 1.7? Well, very much depends on uh, immigration. Um, I mean, our population still continues to grow, partly because of immigration. Got it. And these are, this is, uh, I believe that 1.7 is uh, citizen women, people, uh, people who are tracked by the census. But there are a lot of people who are having babies who are not tracked by the census and, uh, and, and who are not part of the statistics. That's, not a big, that's 11 million, though. That's, that's, that's say, 11 to uh, 14 million, right? If you talk about illegal immigrants that we cannot track, so uh, you're not talking about immigrants coming in because that's about 47 million, right? 40 to 47 million, depending on what stats you're looking at. So, but if we're at 1.7, are you saying this 330 could go lower and lower and lower? Um, it could go lower, certainly, if, if uh, total fertility rate continues to decline, sure. The, with the current trend where we are, have you, have you, or maybe, you know, you're in the world, so maybe you have read uh, papers on this, have you seen any papers talking about if that number is going lower to the point, if we're ever going to get to the one or below one, and what that's going to look like in America if we get to that point, or no? Uh, I haven't read anything okay. along those lines. I know that Korea is an outlier. It has, as South I said, Korea, 1. Yeah, 1. South Korea, South Korea, one, yeah. one, one per woman per lifetime. So we could certainly uh, look at a demographic collapse um, um, at some point in the future, after 2100, uh, population of the world could, could really go down. That will retard economic growth because it will retard innovation. And also remember that we have tens of trillions of dollars of future commitments uh, to our retirees, uh, paying down the debt and so forth. And uh, if we don't have the workers to do it, then uh, how are we going to get that money exactly. through taxes to be able to pay that off? So we yeah. kind of do need to, so, okay. Uh, so, so is there a number to uh, help sustain economic growth? Uh, is there a number for that? Well, or? It's, uh, I don't think about it in terms of numbers. I mean, I think that human freedom actually trumps even things like population growth. In other words, I want women to have as many children as they want. Um, or uh, none. Uh, or none. But, but, and this is crucial, I also don't want... Americans, American women, American men, American parents, to be unduly influenced by environmental extremists and uh, people like AOC, for example, who genuinely believe that women shouldn't have m more than one child or no child at all. In other words, I want Americans, especially American women, to make an informed decision about whether they should have more children or not, decide for themselves freely without being brainwashed uh, by the extremists who say that we shouldn't really have more babies. Well, I mean, then what that makes me think about is, I don't know the stats, but let's just say if, if a uh, uh, UC Berkeley can house 40,000 students per year, just let's just say it's 40,000 students that are going through Berkeley, and we know what Berkeley teaches, go furthest left, put uh, Berkeley, put Brown, put whatever, whatever, whichever one of those universities, but let's pick Berkeley. Every year, 40,000 students are replenishing through that mindset, and that mindset is capitalists are bad, capitalism is this, it's rich, greedy people, all they want to do is this, and negative, 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 and they're breeding these kids, right, the future. Then you go to another school, like let's just say Wharton Business School that's teaching business, entrepreneurship, all that stuff. If one school has got only 10,000 students, the other one's got 40,000 students, every year for Xing the growth, that mindset like an investment is growing, it's going to be very hard to compete. So in the world, if there is a country that ought to have more kids than anybody else to continue the mindset of capitalism, it's probably got to be U.S., but we're not doing that. So I don't know if I'm making sense, if I sound like I'm on shrooms um, or something. Well, the, the, the issue here is, you know, you can extrapolate any problem into the future and yeah. see collapse. The question is whether we are going to change the way that we are looking uh, at higher education. Yeah. Now, I already see a lot of people like Peter Thiel, for example, talking about, you know, do people really need to go to school to, to, to study sure. humanities and social sciences sure. where they don't necessarily learn any useful skills and may actually um, 
be brainwashed into believing in the wrong stuff. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe the university model is unsustainable, partly because it is so incredibly expensive. You know the reasons why. I mean, there is huge tuition inflation because of all the free money that is being, or rather heavily subsidized loans and so on. Um, and also, um, you know, at some point, um, uh, Americans may get fed up with the extreme left-wing propaganda which is being which is being um, which is being taught uh, at American universities, and decide that they don't want to send their children there. Uh, maybe rather do online courses with established mainstream academics. Um, all sorts of things could happen over the next 10, 20, 30 years, which will completely change this particular dynamic. Right now, what we are seeing is that even though communism, socialism have collapsed in the late 1990s, mm -hmm. 1980s, mm -hmm. Marxists have retreated into universities, but they have carried on their evil works. And uh, they have carried on uh, educating uh, future generations of, of pupils, uh, including Americans, and now we are reaping the harvest of that. Yeah, I mean, I've interviewed any of the top communist professors in U.S. or socialist professors in U.S., I've probably interviewed them, whether it's, uh, uh, you name them, whether it's Richard Wolff, who is a uh, you know, very open socialist, or Asitar Bear, who's a openly communistic professor mm -hmm. in uh, Riverside Community College. Uh, we like to interview them to kind of see what the mindset is sure. and how it's being taught. Uh, I get well, a kick Well, it's very out of big that. of you because, of course, leftists don't really talk to people who don't think like that. I love talking to communists because it's just a matter of time till the argument doesn't make sense and you're hoping it says, well, 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 then it's, you know, so then, then we, we, the audience can make a decision for themselves. But let me give you uh, some other numbers here. I'm curious to know what you think about this. So, is it, should we, is it, is it better for a country to be younger or older? So younger, more energy, more innovation, more rebellious, more pushback, more questioning. Older, a little bit more, the drive to compete is a little less maybe, no longer wanting to argue every point, just doesn't even have the energy to argue at every point, thinking about a different way. What is the edge? If, you, if we look at historically, the, societies that did very, very well, what was the, I'd be so curious to know, what was the average age of a citizen of a country that was dominating at an era? Do we, do we have that data or no? Well, I don't personally look at it that way because, you know, um, I, I don't believe that sort of individuals and their life expectancies exist in order to benefit the state. I'm thinking about it, you know, does the state provide the environment in which individuals can flourish? If individuals want to have more children, fewer children, if they want to live long, uh, and if they can live long, you know, that to me is a, is a good thing. What I would say is that more important than the structure of the population is whether the country is free. Free to, uh, w whether the people are free to talk, to uh, think, to exchange their ideas, um, invent, innovate, try those ideas in the marketplace, have access to capital. Those, I think, are more important. I'll tell you a perfect example. Regardless of age. Regardless of age. I mean, I mean, yes, regardless of age. And I'll tell you why. Um, China before 1978 and after 1978. China before 1978 already had hundreds of millions of young people. But it was a dirt poor country. GDP per capita in 1960 was like $300 per year, right? Um, why was it dirt poor? It's because people were not free to do anything, to utilize their brain power, to uh, grow the economy, okay? Today, China is, of course, the second largest economy in the world. Why? Because the state has taken its foot off the neck um, of, of the Chinese people. The Chinese people are now have much more freedom. It's still a very authoritarian country, but it's nothing compared to what China was before 1978. And the effect of that is showing itself. Same in India. Incredibly young and incredibly um, a populous country before 1991. Very, very poor. Then come economic reforms. The country becomes freer. And after that, India grows. So I think that freedom is more important than, than the particular structure of the population. But I think that as a general rule, more pe people times freedom equals prosperity. Okay, so let's, that, great point, excellent, very helpful. But let's put 10 countries, freedom to innovate, freedom to do all that stuff at the same level. Yeah. 
Put it all at the same level, right? The, 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 well, then again, does, age, does age make any difference or still not? I don't know because I, I don't know, but I doubt it because young people will be more go and getter attitude, you know, risk taking mm -hmm, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But older people have more knowledge. You see, old people have accumulated wisdom, which the young don't have. We and that's know, also we, very useful. We know where innovation comes, though. Steve was Steve Jobs was in his twenties with Wozniak, or Zuck was in his twenties, yeah. maybe teens. Sure. Gates uh, was younger, you know, Musk uh, was younger. So it, you're very rarely gonna hear a fifty seven year old start the next Facebook as no, a founder. But all the people then run those companies which these geniuses start, um, because uh, they know. But how remember, to manage I'm talking about so birth. I'm talking yeah. about giving birth, yeah. right? To me, yeah. I you know the whole who what came first, the chicken or the egg? I'm talking about who's giving birth to those ideas. Well, By the way, I don't have the answer to the question. Yeah, I'm yeah, curious yeah, to know what you yeah. think about um, this. I, I am aware of the fact that when it comes to fundamental breakthroughs in uh, things like uh, physics, mathematics, people tend to be on the younger side. And once they discover something, uh, they tend not to repeat important discoveries later on in life. So uh, yes, but there are other things that go on in a society. It's not just about technological development. There is also things like, uh, for example, listen to the oldies. Um, explain why the world is not in a worse shape to remember the Cold War and the dangers that emanated from the world History, right then. Yeah. To have some knowledge about the importance of institutions which we have, such as democracy and, and, um, and separation of powers. Um, you know, young people tend not to think about those things, uh, but they are, they are very important. I ask you because you got, chi the other day I was looking up these numbers, the average age of population in China as of 2019 was 38.4. And that's the data they give us. So maybe higher, maybe lower, you have to trust the data that there's slow. Just like they tell you their unemployment is 2% right now, which no one believes that. But they say the average age of population in China is 38.4, okay? U.S. is 38.1. So we're not far off. It's mm -hmm. not like, oh, U.S. is such a young population. We're not, right? Then it goes, India shows 26.4. Yeah. So China is 38.4, U.S. is 38.1, India is 26.4, and they're now capitalism. They're producing great engineers. These guys are being recruited to the states left and right because they produce I mean, most of my software that I develop. A lot of the engineers that we use here from state that came out of IIT. So I'm wondering because if we if we look at the enemy of the state number one right now, enemy of the world right now, country. If all the countries were one person. If all the countries were one country, we got 200 give or take countries. That number, some say 191, 206, whatever. Let's just say we got 200 countries give or take, right? If all the countries were one country and they were to pick enemy of the state number one, enemy of the world number one, you're probably going to see China be at the top of the list, okay? And I'm not saying some don't see U.S. as the top of the list because of how deceiving, you know, their alliances. Most of the world doesn't want to align themselves with Iran, but China does. Most of the world doesn't want to align themselves with Taliban, but China does. Or North Most, Korea, yeah. Or North Korea. So, so China's number one above all. Okay. I ask this question because to me, I think India is going to play a very role, uh, important role to keep the world a better place. Young, big population, capitalism, freedom. They push back 100 apps, 100 apps from China that they didn't let into India, so they're not afraid of China to go up against them. Some of these other guys are afraid of them. And I think China... They indirectly take a lot of shots at India, and the only reason you ever take a lot of shots at an opponent is because secretly you're threatened by that opponent, that they could do something to you, right? What are your thoughts about the future of India? Do you think they're going to play a very big role the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? I think that you're onto something. I think that if I were to predict, you know, how the next, say, 50 years are going to play out in terms of economic growth, I would say that India is probably going to grow at a faster pace, uh, not just because their population is younger. Um, um, meaning that more people are entering the, war, the, the, the labor market. But China, very importantly, is shooting itself in the foot in two crucial ways. The most important way, or rather one of the ways, is the one-child ch one policy, which was imposed between 1980 and 2015. That has created a huge, huge hole in the, in the population pyramid in China. Uh, which is why the Chinese now are talking about, now, now they had two-child policy, now they are thinking about three-child policy and that sort of thing. So they shot themselves in the foot. They have, uh, they, have, they have a lot of people who are going to become retirees and they have many fewer people who are, who are, who are not there yeah. 
to pay for all the things that sure. the Chinese government yeah. now. That's a scary given. thought, by the way. Mathematically, um, it just doesn't make any sense. So that's one thing. The other thing is that China is clamping down on uh, freedom of all sorts, but intellectual freedom, uh, freedom to think and speak and interact, publish, uh, research, and so forth. Um, and, and that obviously is something that you, I, I wouldn't expect to happen in India because India has a long track record of uh, uh, being a democracy and having a rule of law, neither of, neither of which is obviously present in China. Yeah, but as long as uh, a leader doesn't come in in, in in India that gets voted, that all of a sudden gets close to, to Xi or China, the world's a safe place. If, in, to me, the scariest day is when India and China are on the same team. I think that's the scariest day. The, the world has to worry when India and China are on the same page. Well, hopefully that will never happen. Yeah, well, uh, well I, the, but the game that China plays, they are incredible at that game. No one's better at playing the deceiving game today than China is, not even U.S. They used to be the best. You know, Russia used to be the best. Israel used to be the top four best. But today, you know, China's coming up in ways they can do a master class on that and you know, and nobody would even be close to them. So that's my Certainly biggest Certainly many of their actions, including uh, what they've done to Hong Kong, was um, completely unacceptable. Uh, it was, uh, Hong Kong was, of course, the greatest, possibly the greatest success story of the post-Second World War era in terms of economic growth, and um, they destroyed that. But the world is letting it happen. That's, well, that's, uh, uh, there is very little that you can do to a country of one point, whatever it is, uh, two or three billion yeah, people but, but and thousands of nuclear weapons. I, Nobody's going to go to a nuclear conflict over Hong Kong or indeed Taiwan, I yeah, think. Yeah, I disagree there. The, the, and by the way, I don't mind having a disagreement. You can come back and, you know, say, you know, you have the PhD. Uh, Please, don't mention the, that. I have the public high school diploma. That's the closest <laughs> that's, thing to PhD that's I That's perfectly got, fine. So. That's but, 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 but for me, uh, uh, any time we underestimate an enemy, and they keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. You're sometimes we shouldn't underestimate them, but it's very important that Americans should also understand that there's a lot that we can do to get back on track in terms of American dream, uh, growing the economy, yeah. having a strong country. Um, you know, we, there's very little that we can do about what the Chinese Politburo does. But what we can do is to is to alter our economic system so that it is not so heavily overtaxed, overregulated, so dysfunctional. Um, we can stop being at each other's throats um, and, and things which, which make us weaker. We can generate more economic growth. We don't have to borrow so much money. Uh, much of it is, yeah, is, is lent yeah. to China. Um, you know, we just have to become serious about our own country. We have to become serious about, about challenges in the future and uh, we have to um, and we have to change the way that uh, right now it sort of feels like we are not very serious about our own future it's as though we don't want to have a future yeah to me it's more from the school of thought of you know if, if China's got 1.5 the world's got eight six and a half billion against 1.5 take some of the countries that would be on China's side give them another half a billion okay let's put them at two billion Two billion against six billion, the world still whoops their ass, right? So the world's got to come together and hold them uh, uh, accountable and publicly call them out. It has to be very public about it because at this point of the game, they're not slowing down. They're telling you, we're going to come after you. You can't do nothing about it. The world's like, I don't think they can. I don't think they can. I don't think they can. In sports, in sports you got two things you got to play. Historically, the most exciting teams to ever watch in the season are the offensive teams. Oh my gosh, Dan Antoni was a coach. Any team he ever coached, great offensive team to watch. The Suns, the oh, we're gonna average 130 points a game. Never won a championship, right? Then you go look at Popovich, a boring team to watch, not the most exciting team Spurs to watch, but they won five championships in the last 20 years, right? I think we have to have a balance of offense and defense. Uh, and obviously as a capitalist, I'm on the offense side, but I think we need a little bit more uh, attention to defense. We cannot let this, what happened last 18 months, go away with us not holding those guys accountable because they'll do it again. But oh, also remember that yeah. we don't actually know how well China is doing and how, how much on an offense it is. Um, we don't really know what their real GDP growth yeah. numbers are. We don't really know what their unemployment figures are. We don't really know about the health of the Chinese private sector. Are you insinuating something? Are you insinuating that they could have their own market collapse potentially that we're not aware of? Are you 
Well, I'm not insinuating anything. I'm saying that 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 we have no we have very little idea about what is happening in China yeah. in the same way that we had very little idea about what was happening in in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was a massive surprise to everyone, including people who should have known better, such as CIA. What's the biggest difference between those two way of thinking? Well, uh, that the Soviets didn't have a market economy and the Chinese have a quasi-market economy. Now, the, 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 but the important thing is that China has much less of a market economy now than it had five or ten years ago because she is clamping down on the private sector to the extent that it wasn't done between 1980 and 2010. 2010. So, so he's got this view of totalitarizing everything, of, of, of putting everything under his own control. But men are fallible, especially with men with so much power, especially men who have to make all of these calls. And if he makes the wrong calls, then China will suffer the consequences. Oh, I agree with you. Did you see what George Soros, this is very weird when George Soros, did you see the comments he made about China? I did not. Okay, so Ray Dalio uh, comes out and Ray Dalio says, you know, he's lowered his investments in U.S., and he's increased in China. And he came out and says, look, it's a mistake if investors don't look at the advantages in China. So we, think we need to make more investments into China. There's so many opportunities there. And Ray Dalio is somebody I've interviewed before. Very smart man, brilliant mind. George Soros, not beloved by the right, not beloved by the center, not beloved by a lot of people, maybe by the far left. It's George Soros, right? George Soros comes out and says it's a mistake for America to do business with China. It's a mistake that Dalio is saying that it's safe to make investments in China because we don't look at democracy the same way. This is George Soros saying that. So, you know, it, it, some of the stuff that's being said right now, it's, it's almost as if Xi's maneuvering and the moves he's making, it's forcing a lot of people in U.S., left or right, to kind of unite and say, look, I may not agree with you on taxes. You may not agree with me on such and such policy, but we have to agree on one thing. China's an enemy, enemy to state number one. we got to figure that part out. There's a lot of things we can be divided on. We cannot be divided on the enemy. And I'm seeing that as a progress, as a positive, meaning if Xi continues to play his cards the way he is, I think it's actually going to unite America more. What do you think? I think that we shouldn't uh, overreact. Um, you know, we have plenty of problems of our own. We have a uh, $30 trillion uh, debt. Uh, we are running huge deficits. And um, um, I think that we shouldn't go and look for enemies um, unless those enemies reveal themselves um, in a clear way, such as Al Qaeda did on 9 11. Um, so far, China has not, to my knowledge, um, attacked American vital national interest uh, front line. Should that change, then we can have a, that discussion again. That's not their style, though. That's not how they attack. They don't attack that way. They attack through proxy. They don't attack that way. They don't attack like America attacks. See, uh, uh, America attacks, hey, you want to fight? Let's fight. Let's use the better man. Okay. Now, don't get me wrong. We've had, you know, I've had the economic hitman on my show who he explained to me in the 60s and 70s how they would go to countries and say, if you don't do this, we're going to put your country out and we're going to do this, this. America played a lot of games as well, but China doesn't play that game. China plays proxy wars. And it I, may well be that, yeah. forgive me, you were saying. No, no, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. It may well be that, uh, you know, China also realizes that this may well be the peak of its power. And so it does want to do all those things that China you wanted think to do. That. Well, the Chinese are probably operating with much better numbers than, than we have. They are seeing the demographic collapse coming. Yeah. Uh, they realize they, they, they made a lot of people in the world angry, which has contributed to um, uh, undermining the trade relations between the rest of the world and China. They know that by, at this stage, a lot of the world is looking at them in a, um, in a, uh, with, a skeptical, with a skeptical eye. So, you know, once again, I just don't want to extrapolate this particular problem un yeah. un until it becomes uh, um, un unsalvageable. It may well be that, you know, 10 or 20 years time, we'll be looking at the, this particular period in China as, as the height of its power. I hope you're right, but a lot, of off, a lot of people have said that the last 20 years, and they've not been right. They've, cut, they've kept, I had a, a 
Gordon Chang, I believe, sure. who was a yeah. lawyer who lived in China for 20 years, and he wrote a book about the collapse of China like 20 years ago or 15 years ago. None of it happened. So I think that's the level of optimism from the right that uh, uh, is uh, uh, thinking they're always stronger and uh, kind of th looking at the opposition as not as strong as them. I think that level of uh, too confident is how it, get, how it gets some people to get knocked out. You know, you, you mentioned... Uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, where China's at and, you know, maybe they're starting to realize they're weak. Xi, when, you, when you're the leader of a country and you get up and you give a speech that you know it's going to be public on the world news, everyone's going to read it and see it, and you say, if anybody around the world tries to change our way of socialism thinking, we will smash their heads against the wall of China. That's not, you know, seduction. That's not saying, hey, why don't we create a I'm Under no circumstances yeah. am I uh, an, an apologist for Xi. All I'm saying is that America has to be circumspect. We have to tell them what our clear lines, red lines are. Yeah. But, you know, let's, 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 not, <laughs> let's not have a conflict with a nuclear power unless we can, uh, if we can avoid it. Yeah. And then let's not let them get stronger than they are today. Because if they do, then it's too late. That's, that's the part that I'm concerned about. Again, you know, I, I'm, I'm just a businessman. What the hell do I know? I'm just, you know, asking questions here and I'm conducting an interview. So let me continue. So out of these 10 uh, uh, global trends that you have, okay, we got a lot of them. We've covered one of them here. Which of these concerns you the most and which of them should we be most excited about out of these 10 trends? And to remind you, the great enrichment, end of poverty, running out of resources, uh, peak population, uh, end of famine, uh, more land for nature, planet city, democracy on the march, long peace, safer world. Which well, let, one? Me take, let me take two because they're kind of interrelated. Please. And that's, uh, that's uh, um, food supply and nature. So since the birth of agriculture 12,000 years ago, yep. uh, people have lived on the edge of starvation. Uh, famines were recurrent throughout the world, uh, often in very short intervals. Tens of millions of people throughout history have died because they didn't have enough food. Um, today, calorie consumption in sub-Saharan Africa, which is the poorest region of the world, is equivalent to what it was in Portugal in the early 1960s. We are producing enough food to feed every human being on Earth and have some left over. Now, of course, we are not doing such a good job at that because some of the food, you know, gets wasted, um, rots, and, and, and so on. But if, 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 um, if, if the calories that the world produces right now were optimally distributed around the world, then no one uh, should go hungry. And we can, we can, we can and, and we are becoming more and more agriculturally productive. If, um, if the world farmer, if the average world farmer becomes as productive in terms of food production as an American farmer, we can feed the world and return land size the size of India back to nature. Say that one more time. Say that one more time. If, if, if the average world farmer yep. becomes as productive as an American farmer, then we can feed the entire world and return the land mass the size of India back to nature because we wouldn't need it. The problem right now is that in many poor countries, farmers are not particularly um, productive, whereas American farmers are hyper productive. We feed not just the 330 million Americans, but we feel, uh, feed m much of the world. Not just that, but food is decreasing in price. Uh, I'm not talking about the last six months yep. blip in terms of, uh, in terms of, um, in terms of inflation. I'm talking about a long-term trend. Uh, Americans now spend something like 8% of their budget on food, okay? Whereas before, sort of medieval Europe, it was 80% of people's incomes were spent on food. Today, it's more like 8%. Holy moly. And think about it also this way. Um, the, the minimum wage in America, the federal minimum wage is about $7, seven and a half dollars or something like that, yeah. But 90% of Americans bring home, 90% uh, of people uh, who have unskilled jobs earn about $12 an hour, okay? A Costco chicken costs $5, right? And that has enough calories to maintain you for, for a day. That's two, two and a half thousand, thousand calories. So, for, so an unskilled worker, a, a, a janitor, working on minimum wage earns enough money in one hour to feed himself for a day 
and have still some money left over. That gives you a sense of how incredibly, uh, how, how, what an incredible improvement we have experienced in terms of food production. And going back to nature, obviously, um, it would be nice if we could return more of nature to, to the animals and withdraw humanity from nature because, because farming is the most disruptive thing that you can do for an ecosystem. But the only way that you can do it is to bring people into the cities and to become more agriculturally productive. So right now people are already doing things like um, building um, uh, greenhouses inside cities, you know, in skyscrapers mm -hmm. using LED lights mm -hmm. and things like that. So I'm yep. very excited about that. Um, um, smart farming, uh, giving the plant just as much water as it needs, no more, which again doesn't waste resources. Um, and instead of having to transport all that food from, from a farm a thousand miles away, you can actually produce this within, within an urban setting. That would be cool too. So there are a lot of things which humans are doing to adapt, to, uh, to improve, to innovate, and, and we are doing that in terms of food production. Yeah, you said something in your book. Since 1961, the global average population weighted food supply per person per day rose from 2196 calories to 2962 in 2017. So 800 more calories a day in roughly 50 years, right? 56 years. That's right. That we're getting 800 more calories. But uh, I see some people in America, they take sure. a lot more than 2,900 yeah. calories. And again, that 4, may calories a day type of people. I, so do we need to kind of get them to redistribute the food they're eating? What we need to do is to understand that humans have evolved to consume as much food as possible because food was very scarce and uh, supply of food was very uncertain. So one day you may uh, come upon a, a slaughtered deer or something like that. Well, you wanna munch as much of it as possible because you don't know when again you'll be able to slaughter an animal. Um, and so we have evolved to be, to, to gorge basically, right? Um, and, and people have to understand that actually, no, uh, the fridge will be full tomorrow morning and the day Don't later. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Cut those portions and so on. Uh, and uh, here again, I think that, you know, people need to be educated about, not, not in a sort of silly top-down way, but, but explaining people why they do certain things. Not, 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 not forcing them to pay extra pennies for soda or something like that, but just explaining why you are doing the stupid stuff that you are doing uh, may actually help more. So uh, uh, that's uh, uh, good on the educational side. We're living in an era right now where a little bit more of a force is uh, intact today in America over choice. It used to be a big choice country. Now it's more force. You better do this or else dot, 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 dot. We're kind of going in that direction, which concerns certain people. But uh, one of the things we talked about was uh, uh, oil. Oil uh, uh, prices going up, and you know, what if it goes up? It's gone down. Now it's at a point where the guys are making some money. Texas people are making money, but you got some countries that are flat out coming and saying, "Look, by 2030, we're going to be 50% electric cars. By 2050, we're 100% electric cars." U.S. has come out and said, "Our goal is to be, you know, 25% by 2030." You got General Motors. You got these cars are manufacturers. Big ones are coming out and saying, "This is the direction we're going." Uh, what's what's going to happen to oil come 10, 20 years from now? What, what need are we going to have for oil 10, 20 years from now? Well, much will depend on what happens in terms of other innovation. Much will happen, you know, if, if we have a finally... Look, people are probably not going to change their minds about fission, which is unfortunate uh, because fission nuclear is a marvel. It's been around for 70 years. It produces plenty of energy without any CO2 emissions, but for reasons which are difficult for me to understand, people just don't want fission. But if we could have fusion and get plenty of energy and electricity from, from fusion, which is much, much safer um, than even fission reactors, then, uh, then, then you know, that, that could be one way in which you decrease your reliance on fossil fuels, such as oil. Um, other things, breakthroughs in hydrogen, um, maybe even solar could become more, uh, more um, efficient and things like that. So, so uh, the, the future for oil doesn't seem very bright. Um, and, but, but remember that only a few decades ago, people have been worrying to death about, about high stratospheric prices of oil. Mm -hmm. And in fact, just a few decades ago, people have been worrying about running out of all sorts of natural resources. In fact, that's not what we are seeing. 
what we are saying is that natural resources are becoming cheaper over time. And that's very counterintuitive because, because a lot of people still think that if population of the world is growing, natural resources must be diminishing and therefore becoming mm -hmm. more expensive. Yep. That is not what we found. Uh, over at the Simon Project, what we found was that between 1980 and uh, 2020, world's population increased by 75%, but the prices of natural resources fell by 75%. There is a one-to-one -one offset. Every 1% increase in population decreases the prices of natural resources by 1%. It's a very counterintuitive finding. Interesting. Yeah, it's a very counterintuitive but, Every but it's, 1% but it is real. increase in population decreases the value of resources by 1%. Uh, decreases the price of resources by 1%. So what's happening, obviously, is that you have more people innovating and coming up with solutions to, to, to problems. Yeah. Uh, we are becoming, uh, you know, we, we save resources uh, instead of, uh, um, you know, a, 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 a pound of aluminum now produces many more Coke cans than it did before. Our cars are much more efficient. Just to give you an example, you know, a Ford truck in 1970 produced like 12 miles in the city. Today it's 24 miles in the city on a, what is it, on a gallon or something like that. Um, uh, F-130, F-150, F-150, <laughs> that's the one. Um, so, uh, so we conserve more and we are also coming up with different ways of, uh, we also um, we also no longer use certain things which we used before. So um, one way, I don't know, we used to make candles out of whale, uh, whale brains, right, out of whale fat. We no longer do that. We use, we use electricity. We no longer use bird poop, guano, in order to fertilize our fields. We now use, um, we now use uh, artificial uh, a fertilizer. So there are m many ways in which in which humanity is actually getting around the resource problem and making resources actually decoupling decoupling economy from from resources. Mm. There's a wonderful book which I highly recommend to your listeners. Um, in addition to Ten Global Trends, <laughs> uh, it's it's Andrew McAfee's uh, More from Less. And what Andrew found is that um, I, I would recommend that you have him on, on your show. What Andrew found was that um, uh, truly sophisticated economies like the United States and the United Kingdom reached their peak usage of natural resources in 2000. And since then, there has been a decoupling going on between, pop, uh, between, between economic growth and use of resources. So today, we are using absolutely, not relatively, but absolutely fewer resources than we did 20 years ago, even though the economy 20 continues to grow. 20 percent less resources than 20? No, uh, we are using, uh, in absolute terms, the tonnage of copper right. and nickel right. and, and whatever else is lower today than, 20 than what ago. it was in 2000, even though the economy is obviously, whatever it is, higher, I don't know, right. 20 percent higher, sure. 15 percent, I don't know. So there has been this decoupling huh. going on. Um, you know, we are no longer dealing necessarily with a lot of resources. A lot of, a lot of wealth that is produced in the West is in form of knowledge, in bits, uh, not, not in form of, um, you know, um, physical stuff. Let, let, let me ask this question. Did you say from 1980 to 2020 the population grew by 75 percent? Correct. So, so let me get this straight. You're saying the population grew 75 percent from 1980 to today. Correct. But you're saying it's going to be around... One billion higher or one billion less of what we have today, which is eight billion, as of 2100. Yes, because how does that make any sense? Because the crucial thing is the TFR, total fertility rate, which was much higher in uh, the 2.4 versus in, the five. Uh, yes, because it was much higher in 1980. How? Uh, what was that number? What was TFR? In I can't remember what it was, but it would I have mean, been somewhere between five and 2.4. Maybe it was like four. 1980 TFR. Now I'm curious. Because that is, so, so you, you've read the articles where Bill Gates, hey, what's your biggest concern right now? 1980, TFR was 1.77, uh, uh, whatever that number is. So that's statistic, if you see 8, 1980, for us to double from 19... That's the United States. That's so the United, United States. States. You so have to put in global. Okay. Global TFR. Fertility rates, we can I look at so that. I'm curious right now to see what that was in 1980. Uh, children per woman uh, in 1980 was a, around four. So 1965, 1980, four, four today, 2.4. 2. 
And that's how you get a 75% increase between 1980 and 2020. Wow. And that's why we could end up with fewer people in 2100 than we have now. But, but let me ask well, you. Well, what did Bill Gates say? I, I, I missed no, no, that Bill one. Gates said the biggest concern he has is the uh, pop population growth. So. Um, you know, I, I, yeah. I, I respectfully disagree. I, I like Bill Gates very much, but I disagree with that. Uh, I'm on the same page as, as, uh, as Musk, um, um, Elon Musk. Uh, he says that depopulation is number one uh, threat to humanity or number two threat to humanity after AI. Meanwhile, he wants to go live on Mars. So how does that make any sense? So he wants to go the population here He's worried and then about go AI. to Mars and start his own little community. He's probably worried about AI. So on the AI part, so let's talk about AI. I'm not a specialist on that. I, have to I know you're not. I just want to hear your opinion. I, I, got a, I want to hear your opinion on AI and Iran because you had a couple things to say about Iran. But on the AI side, hey, uh, you know where Musk is with AI. You know, hey, we're eventually going to need UBI. Because at one point, and he said this two weeks ago, at one point people are going to choose to have physical labor or not have physical labor. So we're gonna be forced to have UBI. You know, we're not gonna have a choice to do that. Do you agree with that? Um, I, okay, so I started off being a proponent of UBI. I now have a slightly different view on that um, because I think that work is about much more than just earning money. It's also about giving you a sense of meaning in life. And that's especially true. I agree. And that's especially true in a rapidly um, uh, secularizing society where a lot of people don't have religion. I, don't, I take no issue with that one way or another. And also maybe uh, don't have families. Um, you get meaning in life out of three things, uh, three big things, maybe there are more, but it's um, family, religion or work um, and if you have none then I think that leads to a lot of unhappiness a lot of drug use a lot of drug abuse a lot of deaths of despair and things like that so I think that work is important for giving people meaning in life I'm personally irreligious but work obviously fulfills me tremendously mm -hmm. now now so what I'm saying now is sure go ahead with UBI but try it at a state level in other words, don't impose UBI on the United States, but as a whole, try it at a state level and see how it works. If people get more jobs, if they are happier, then we can talk about it and we can see if we can scale it up. But in the meantime, let's start small and let's see what happens. Yeah, I hope they started in Vermont and just stay there and uh, just keep it there and not, not come to any other states. The concern I have with UBI is we learned what happened with UBI the last 12 months. Uh, we gave a few trillion dollars of UBI, essentially, when the money went out to folks. And what happened the last 12 months? The billionaires became so rich that uh, they've never had this kind of money before. So the rich became richer due to UBI. Why? Because you give money to people that don't know how to handle it, they're going to go buy products of folks who run a business and they're going to make their money. Money always flows to the top. That's my opinion. I may be wrong, but I think money's always going to flow to the top. So I think the rich is probably going to be like, yeah, do UBI. I don't care. I have a net. Free money. It eventually and your money will end is going to end pocket. up in my pockets anyway. So the more UBI they do, the Warrens and the AOCs, that money ends up with the people they hate the most. That's just how math works. Yeah. Now, right. Rail Kurzweil has a slightly different vision of the future. And the, 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 Who's this? Uh, the, the people behind um, Singularity, which is that at some point in the future, we could have machines doing all the work. Um, and people own machines. And some people will own machines. Yeah. But the point is that um, um, even then, I think, some form of mental exertion, physical exertion, some sort of a goal will be very important because people without goals, without meaning, are not, you know, it's, it's, it's not a good thing. I, I don't disagree. You know, anytime I've had too much time on my hand, I dyed my hair orange. I did some weird things. The more active I am, the more things I'm doing, the fewer dumb things I do, for whatever reason. I like activity um, too it's, much. It's perfectly possible yeah. that, you know, that's another... Uh, I don't want orange hair. I'm just, I'm and, not going to do and it. Another trend which we have is, of course, that people are working less than they, than they used to. In high-income countries between 1950 and 2020, uh, the amount of war, uh, hours of work spent uh, fell by 20%. So we have more time to spend with our own minds thinking about the many ways in which we are maybe falling short of our own standards or comparing ourselves to other people. And when that happens, 
That's mental. also a problem. Yeah, you know, in 1880, the average American worked 69.1 hours per one hour per um, week. Yeah, I'm not surprised at all. Yeah. Today it's 39. The, the the city where people work the most hours per week is a city called Plano, Plano in Texas. They average 41.7, 40, like nearly 42 hours, and there's some other places like that's that that's 33, 34, but they're at the top. Last thoughts. You were saying something about the Shah with Iran. Yeah, and it was an opinion. It's not what you study. And I, I'm not, it's not what I study. I'm mean, trying to make a, a yeah. small talk about, of course, your, your own yeah. background. And uh, no, we were talking about uh, the Shah and where it went wrong. And then you had the Islamic Revolution. And, you know, we are all paying the price for that in the sense that we have this very ugly uh, and repressive regime in Iran uh, for the last uh, 40 years. I, you know, Shah was a modernizer. Uh, who tried to really bring Iran forward. Um, uh, I, th I think that probably um, there were a lot of people who were very dissatisfied with, with the pace of reforms, right? I mean, you look at videos from, uh, um, uh, from Tehran in the 1970s, and you have women with the Western hairdos right. and miniskirts Skin. and things like that. It's yeah. uh, unbelievable. So there was a conservative backlash. But also, it's not like Shah was a, uh, was a saint. I mean, there was a lot of corruption going on, especially uh, amongst the government officials. Um, Sabak, the, the, the secret police, mm -hmm. was brutal. But in no way as brutal as what we have in Iran now, of course, where they you know, string homosexuals from, from lampos. I mean, it's absolutely insane. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, uh, heroic failure. Unfortunately, um, he, he, he didn't get us where we need to be. Nobody makes that dramatic of a positive impact in a country with being normal. It's just not going to happen because they have to have a, it's a complicated individual, you know, who the Shah was. Uh, but it's another example of what happens when a country makes such great advancement that people either become greedy or they start complaining. And what do the complainers do? They bring the current Iran that they have. And I'm in, I'm in U.S. right now because of what Jimmy Carter did when he went to Iran. Uh, and Jimmy Carter's got to run for his money right now because he used to be known as the worst president, but things have changed. <laughs> and uh, he's probably sleeping much better today because of the current climate. Anyways, having said that, Dr. Tupi, thanks for coming out. Folks, we're going to put the link below to his book, The Ten Global Trends, uh, written by Dr. Tupi. Link, link will be below for you guys to be able to order it and read it. Appreciate you for coming out. Thank I really you. enjoyed this. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yes. Interesting interview. Which of those top trends he talked about concerns you the most? I'm curious. Comment below. I want to hear about it. If you enjoyed it, press the thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. And if you enjoyed this interview, I, I think you'll also enjoy sit down I did with Gad Sad maybe two months ago. We hit it off. You're going to laugh. You're going to crack up. Or you're going to question some things as well. If you've not watched it, click over here. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.